So this is, you know, a little late, I think. Uh, but I, and I think it's worth uh, at least putting this up there for, for those of you who uh, are at least modestly new to genetics. So I, I guess at the moment there are only like two of you in the room. Maybe that qualifies for, but like, there is a question of what is the substance of this genetic information we're talking about, uh, and, and if we do interventions with people uh, who, whose genetic relatedness is known to us, uh, there are, are some things we can do to them, but, but most of the time uh, we're, we're not intervening in samples of people whose genetic relationships with one another are known. In other words, we're not doing stuff to large samples of siblings or twins. Um, so we, we are doing stuff, though, to people uh, who have a readily available uh, you know, piece of biological information that we can get and get a lot out of, right? So we can get them to spit the tube, as was discussed yesterday, and for small amounts of money generate genomes. Uh, and then what can we do with those things? Uh, we can't measure individual genetic variants that have a lot of biological content information in them, uh, and that will also predict substantial amounts of phenotypic variants, right? So this is the problem that genome-wide association studies, so these are big data mining expeditions in which we, we get these days, several hundred thousand individuals, we measure their genomes, and then we correlate each of them, uh, a few hundred thousand or a few million uh, individual genetic variants with some trait. Uh, we find the ones for which that, that correlation has a, has a very small p-value, uh, which still works out to about a 120 false positive rate, uh, and, and, and we call it a day. Um, and we can do that for you know, basically everything that we can show variability for. Um, you know, this is a now quite outdated annotation of the 23 chromosomes. Um, in the human genome with the little dots indicating uh, GWAS discoveries for various kinds of uh, phenotypes. Um, the point of which being just that you know, we've made lots of genetic discoveries, um, but uh, we don't actually have that much information about biology arising from these discoveries. So this is something that came out of a paper that Paige and I wrote last year and which is currently languishing. Uh, somewhere in the production process at Directions of Psychological <laughs> Science, uh, but maybe it's on the uh, Dropbox. I read it yesterday. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you can all you, you can all read it. Uh, but but essentially the idea is that you know we have these GWAS, we make a zillion uh, of these molecular discoveries, um, and, and in theory somehow there's like a miracle happens, and then uh, you know health and well-being in the population are improved. Uh, but that that's not happening. Uh, and it's not happening because we have lots of discoveries, but they have tiny effect sizes and and their biology turns out to be anything but obvious. Um, and so uh, I, I think what I do, uh, and, and what I think we'd like to <coughs> co-opt those of you who are interventionists into helping us do, um, is to rethink how we uh, translate uh, genetic discoveries to improve health and well-being, to essentially help us make the miracle happen. Um, and to do that, uh, there are three general shifts in thinking about genetic information that we're encouraging. Um, one of those is uh, to, to shift from thinking about molecules or the biological mechanisms of genetic influence to thinking about uh, organisms, so whole individual patterns of behavior, um, the environments people select into uh, as being mechanisms of genetic action rather than different, you know, sort of quantities of blood proteins or uh, neurotransmission or something like that. Uh, the, the second shift is from thinking about individual genetic variants uh, to aggregations of genetic variants, and I think Paige is going to show us a slide uh, in, in, in her part of the talk about this, um, but is represented here by the little uh, cartoon distribution there, uh, the idea being that we can take information uh, from very large numbers of these variants um, and from a GWAS, essentially take, you know, treat the GWAS results as an algorithm to score individual genomes that says this person has a uh, genetic likelihood of looking a little bit more like this or like that. So for example, uh, in a GWAS of heart disease, you could come out with uh, what we call a polygenic score, so this multi-locus measure of risk uh, that speaks to that person's liability of developing heart disease of having a heart attack, something like that. Um, with the advent of genome-wide association studies of social and behavioral traits, we can now do the same thing uh, for something like educational attainment, although as Patrick discussed yesterday, uh, the interpretation is, is generally not uh, straightforward. And then finally, um, we tend to think about GWAS of a thing as giving us the genetics of that thing. So if you do GWAS of um, 
heart disease, you think you're getting something about the biology of heart disease, but in fact, heart disease is uh, a phenotype embedded within a network of related phenotypes of environments, of behaviors. And so all the GWAS is telling us is that there is some you know, crazy indirect path between this little bit of DNA uh, and this thing that's happening to a person. And, and that, that path may you know, make its way through all kinds of different uh, uh, parts of human development, uh, aspects of human behavior, uh, or features of the environments that humans inhabit. Um, and so by building what the psychologists I work with have taught me to call nomological networks around the phenotypes of interest, um, we can gain some insight into the uh, uh, nature of the links that connect DNA with differences in human outcomes. Um, so that's the one slide version of like a 10 slide <laughs> talk. Um, <laughs> But here's, a, here's another sort of cartoon representation of how I think about uh, the process of doing genetic research uh, to build information about what connects DNA with differences and, and, and how that informs uh, what we might do from an intervention or social policy perspective. So, so there has to be you know, some kind of discovery enterprise, you know, which Patrick is involved in, uh, which, which Elliot and Paige have gotten involved in. Um, and, and where I think like, there's value for social scientists to, to collaborate, to contribute cultures involved in in you know, sort of amassing large amounts of data uh, on, on socially behavioral phenotype populations, you can do GWAS. Um, where I spend most of my time is doing what I call developmental follow-up, um, where we attempt to understand what it is that links the DNA with the differences. The idea being that that enterprise can give us some information about where we might try to test uh, these kinds of gene environment interactions. Uh, where we might attempt to disrupt a chain of phenotypic causation or enhance a chain of phenotypic causation uh, that connects uh, DNA with, with the outcome of interest. And we started doing that, studying obesity, smoking, and asthma, um, but then uh, they published the GWAS of Educational Attainment, um, and, and we started working on that. And, and so the first thing that we did, um, and I think this, this suggests some potential directions for how we might collaborate with intervention researchers, um, was to ask how genetics associated with educational attainment are associated with uh, broad patterns of human development from very early in life uh, through the middle of the life course uh, and, and how they shape differences in a range of outcomes uh, even beyond educational attainment. So, so the, I think the two principal insights of the paper were in the first case that uh, these genetics uh, manifest their influences very early in human development even before anybody's entered school um, first as uh, kind of earlier onset of, of language acquisition and use, uh, more rapid growth in uh, cognitive functions, um, also advantages in, you know, we might call non-cognitive or, or soft skills, so self-control, uh, interpersonal skillfulness, um, but, but interestingly uh, are not related, at least, you know, saying something is not, but, but effect sizes are, are much smaller uh, where we did test associations with measures of physical health in these kids. Now these are a thousand kids uh, from a single city in New Zealand. Um, uh, so this is obviously you know, sort of a preliminary observation, although as I'll show you, some of the core features of, of, of the, the finding do replicate. Um, the second thing that, that came out of the study was that uh, these genetics have fairly far-reaching consequences for, for uh, human social attainment outcomes well beyond how far you go in school. Um, at, which I'll uh, return to in my next two slides, but just very briefly, there was evidence that these genetics were associated with kids moving up the socioeconomic ladder, with moving out of the place where they were born uh, uh, and into to other places, um, and that they were associated with uh, patterns of uh, mating that might work to reproduce or enhance uh, inequalities across generations. Um, so in the interest of replication, uh, we, we pursued the social mobility observation uh, in data from, from five longitudinal studies, and you know, I apologize for what Patrick has characterized previously as figure vomit. There's a, a lot of you know, <laughs> colors and lines on the uh, side. Uh, uh, but, but you know, the, no, I think it's, I, it's, I, I've taken the point to heart. I just haven't figured out how to clean up my slides yet, but I'm working on it. I said that like complimentary. It's like, Andrew Gunn, like, um, so, but no, I, anyway, uh, but but uh, you know, so there's a, a small print, far away. But the point is, um, 
we assembled data from these five longitudinal studies um, that, that followed people uh, from their childhoods into, in some cases, late life, um, and tracked the socioeconomic circumstances of uh, their family origins and uh, their attainments in terms of their education, uh, their career success, and their accumulation of wealth. Um, and, and what we find in all of these studies is that um, there are correlations between the education genetics you're born with and the socioeconomic status of the family you grow up in. So this is, you know, behavior geneticists we call this a gene environment correlation. Um, and it is something that I think uh, raises a question about these genetic discoveries, so social class and genetics are passed from parents to children. Uh, it could be the case that uh, when you do GWAS of a social class related characteristic, you are picking up uh, the sort of genetic residual of uh, patterns of assorted mating on social class across generations and not uh, genetics that have substantive information about individual differences that mediate uh, social attainment. Um, I think you know, geneticists work very hard to control for that kind of bias in their studies, uh, but another way we can attempt uh, to address that question is by asking whether, independent of where a child was born or the circumstances of they're born into, uh, do these genetics predict uh, uh, future social attainment? Do they move up the social ladder relative to where they were born? Uh, and that would then explain where this gene environment correlation comes from, because if kids with more of these genetics uh, tend to achieve more over the course of their lives, uh, they're going to then have children who inherit both these genetics and uh, the success that their parents achieved. And that's precisely what we see uh, across all of these phenotypes and across all of these studies. Um, Nobody's going to talk about a page. Yeah, we're not going to talk about genetic nurture, so I guess I'll mention here the, the other uh, question I think that was raised for us when we did this analysis and, and when we analyzed data on siblings in the same family, which is a you know, much stronger control for this historical confounding of, of genetic associations, is that the within family associations are you know about half the size of the between family associations. And, and that's a, a bit of a puzzle. It suggests that. Um, one of the reasons these genetics are predicting outcomes is because they're correlated with environments uh, that, that are also predicting those outcomes. Um, and uh, Augustine Kahn and his colleagues did some work in Iceland, uh, which Patrick, you mentioned yesterday, uh, illustrating that, that one source of, of that may be uh, that when we measure a child's genotype, we're, we're in fact getting information about their parents' genetics, and those parental genetics are affecting the child's outcome uh, through non-germline transmission, essentially through an environmentally mediated indirect genetic effect. Uh, and we find evidence of that uh, in, in an analysis we did of mothers and children in one of the studies we analyzed. We found that um, net of the child's own genetics, the mother's genetics group, uh, the child's educational attainment, um, and that's roughly consistent with uh, uh, the difference between the between family estimates and the within family estimates, although uh, Kong obviously has a much more precise specification of that. Um, and you know, stay tuned, Jasmine Wirtz, who is uh, a co-author on this paper, is doing work now to try and understand what those family processes might be that mediate these interaction effects. Yes? I want to try to translate that last bullet point yep. to <clears throat> novice language. The, the idea of knowing your, your, your polygenic score as a covariate for what is internal to you and therefore endogenous to whatever I'm observing uh, may be too simple because your, your GWAS or your, your polygenic score may actually be the, the side effect of your parents' polygenic score, which was really the, the kind of causal effect. And so, in some ways, your own your own polygenic score is kind of confounded or misleading if you think of it as, as a cause. Is that is that correct? That's right. Thinking about your own DNA as being a straightforward cause of your phenotype, and as Patrick said yesterday, is an oversimplification of what's going on here. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think that the reason parental genetics might be related to the child's outcome is that they get given to the child, and then within the child, they build a, a you know an organism that behaves in different ways, which ultimately. Uh, produces a phenotype of interest. As it turns out, um, this is also happening uh, where your parental genetics are associated with, are causal of uh, some environmental differences that are themselves causal of the child's phenotype. So we know, for example, in the case of educational attainment, a lot, a lot of shared environmentality to it. Um, so it's not terribly surprising if you have genetics that within a generation do have some effect on this thing. Uh, then you're going to get essentially uh, a double whammy into the next generation in which the social class that the genetics help you attain in generation one has its own causal effect 
on the child's phenotype in generation two, as do the inherited genetics. So, so I think what's important to think about is, is how that how controlling for your polygenic score in, introduces a confound in the remaining variants in, in your something about your parental environment for aging because it's I think it's just it's like I a mean, collider bias problem. A, 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 I, I sorry to jump in here. But I think of a polygenic score as a variable, right? And so in an, in another analysis, if you had a variable that you measured about people and you introduced it as a you know as a moderator of a treatment effect, it would be it could either be the intelligence of this child that I've measured, or anything that is correlated with, you know, within my population with intelligence. I think a polygenic score um, is different from other variables in the sense that it's fixed at birth, and so isn't reciprocally influenced by environments that the children are experiencing over the course of their lifetime. But it's still correlated, it's confounded with aspects of the parental environment. And I think that's particularly a problem for EA genetics, not so much for, for BMI and height, because there's evidence that there isn't tons of that other path for, for other polygenic scores. But for, for genetic variants associated with education, that down to the right path is important. Right. What so, so pitching this to, to funder, I think that that's something I need to keep in mind as we think about this. Is is what what can you get? What what are the limitations? It feels like that's a good question. So, what are the implications of that for using genetics as a control variable? For me, as a treatment, if my treatment's not parents, it doesn't matter because I'm controlling for both. It's great. But if 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 you were doing what Alex was suggesting, which was kind of trying to partition family environment and genes, as far as I understand what you're saying, then it feels like a different. You have to think carefully about. It. Well, so twin studies don't have this problem, right? Right. So I mean, I think an interesting sort of question that we've talked about some, or that, that I asked Elliot and Paige about periodically, anyway, is, you know, should we expect the magnitudes of these indirect genetic effects to be correlated with the magnitude of C yes. for a for a phenotype? So that's that's something. Uh, that I think is, is potentially of interest, and I, I haven't necessarily figured out precisely what that means in the context of thinking about intervention design. Um, that's one of the things I was asking about, how should we think about <coughs> biometric analysis uh, with respect to informing intervention, but, but I think that's that's worth So I think not just, just a about. thought on that is, I think when we're thinking about how to connect genetics and, and which interventions are relevant to the genetics we have available, um, I think, it's easiest, and this has certainly been the case for me, most obvious to initially think of interventions that are intervening at the level of the child. But then yesterday we were talking about like what's the most effective intervention for combat disorders? Parent training is one of them, right? And so, and so we can also think of if we think that the path between measured genes and complex phenotypes is operating through the parental environment, and we have a parental intervention that is pushing on one of these hypothesized mechanisms. So I think, I think the fact that measured genotypes might be operating through the parental environment broadens the scope of potential classes of interventions that are relevant to push on the, the genotype phenotype. Yeah, so I, I think... Does that make sense? I, yeah, I, I think that's right. I, I mean, this is in some sense like slightly off track since yeah. we're, we're thinking what, what I mean is this study yeah. uh, is, is perhaps less directly relevant to discussions of interventions um, than, than what I was showing you before, in that this is really just arguing these genetics are associated with something that we care about uh, and that we might want to modify. Uh, and so understanding how these genetics work, including through uh, indirect pathways mediated by family environments, is going to help us uh, design better interventions and maybe deliver those interventions uh, more effectively to change children's outcomes. So, so I guess the way I think about genetics informing interventions is, is less genotyping intervention participants to do something with them, although Pietro's going to talk about why we might want to do that, uh, and more about understanding processes that give rise to outcomes that we care about, uh, which in turn can inform uh, the selection of targets for our interventions, not targets as in people, but targets as in uh, the constructs we seek to modify. So if I understand uh, a phenotype, an environment, a behavior that is a critical link between uh, these genetics and a child's educational attainment, upward social mobility, et cetera, uh, then I can deliver an intervention that can modify uh, that phenotype behavior environment in ways um, that attempt to induce the upward social mobility, all these benefits for, for children, regardless of whether they carry the genotype. Um, 
may just uh, so yes. a quick um, two two quick things. So 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 one is that um, so these indirect effects are are genetic, right? Because they're, they're not our genes, but it's it's the only it's the only it's the component of seed that goes to our parents' genetics, right? Well, they're partly our genes. Well, uh, the the whole, the indirect effect. So the um, the reason that you use the non-transmitted alleles in order to uh, test this is because that gives you purchase on and dis differentiating parental from child effects, right? So yeah, that, but, but, but you would inherit half of, half your genes from parents. Yeah, but so, if you got a model where it's like own genotype and parents genotype, then you're, you're separating them entirely. If you simultaneously, model. yeah, yeah, right. Um, and so, so the, uh, it's these indirect effects, though. But it, what, what I get the point that I'm trying to make, though. Is that there's a whole lot of C that isn't genetic, um, and and our genes only capture the genetic part of C, and so it's still part of this like genetic lottery, right? Uh, and, and and I think that does affect a, a little bit how we should think about these these indirect effects and how I, I don't know I, I um it's not that like there's environment that's living in our polygenic scores. It's like, it's, it's all genetic. It's just a different, it's, it's our parents' genes instead of ours. I, I, I don't know if that's... Well, no, but it is environment that's living in our polygenic scores. Well, it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's I, a genetic I, portion. I, Sorry? I agree yeah. that it is. It, it, it is genetic variants in the environment. It's just a different person's genetics that are yeah, 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 producing yeah. the variants. Sure, sure. But, but to, to the degree that we think that um, genes are, are different than non-genetic environment, uh, then... You know, I mean, like, should should we think about this this environmental thing differently than we think about whether it's um, if we just live in a in a poor neighborhood or or something like that? So, so speaking of that, because because I think I think this idea that somehow there's like genetic environments and non-genetic environments is a little bit like there are you know genetic behaviors and non-genetic behaviors. I mean, like, it's all heritable. Yeah, um, we, yeah, but, but there's but there is. I mean, they're they behave differently. The, the, like the, you know, you uh, an exogenously induced change in academic achievement uh, behaves a lot differently. Yeah, it doesn't transfer to everything else. It well, the genes the genes are recurrent boosters. Yeah, right? okay, maybe, because the intervention maybe you give it to someone and then they go home. But the right. genes are a parent's propensity to be warm to their child every day. They, they right. are. So that matters. I, I I I think that we like to say we're we're enlightened. Oh, genetics just indicate environments all the time, but it does really have implications for it, it, genetically induced environments are different in that way from intervention induced environments. So so that actually raises an interesting. I don't know who came up with it, but Ian Deary has popularized to some extent the idea of phenotopy. Right. So if you can understand how the genes are working, then you can. Co copy it not not through a genetic mechanism but through an intervention, right? So if, for instance, the reason that interventions are failing is because they're you give them to kids and then they go home and then their parents treat them the way they've always treated them, whereas the reason the genes work is they do the exact same thing as the intervention, but it's because it's a disposition on the part of the parents. The parents do it every day, day in and day out. Then what you would want to do in theory is create an intervention that copies what the parents are doing, and then they would be the same. Yep. Where that's the assumption. I think the question is, what are the parents doing? So, you know, I guess what I would argue is that one of the things that James can tell us, you know, so perhaps it really is the sustained nature of the uh, warm, sensitive parenting uh, and not the aspects of, of the parenting itself that, that matter. But it's quite possible that we think ought to work. And what's actually doing the work of the genes that are associated with the, the outcome are different. So, you know, I guess what I'm arguing is that the genetics give us another way of finding out what are the things we ought to try and manipulate, you know, with the aim of, of doing this thing. So, I, I'm sorry, I'd I like kind of a basic question. But would, would one of like this, so the, there's no like selection of which genes contribute to the score, right? It's just like you let the machine decide? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, so what we're doing now is we're, you know, we're, you know, the GWAS runs, you know, two million regressions. It gives us a bunch of coefficients. We treat those coefficients as weights uh, in an algorithm. We have this simple additive uh, score then, uh, which which takes the count of education associated alleles weighted by the coefficient describing the magnitude of that association, summed across the entire genome. So, like, one allele could be like being hideously ugly. It has nothing to do with education. Yes. Like, you do not know the mechanisms no of the idea. individual variants. And so, but so it's collapsed a lot of those, across all heterogeneous. Like, and then it's the outcome is. How far do you want to call it? It's machine learning, but it's a very basic sort of but machine learning. Effect. And you're yeah. training it on. Is that so it's how far you, how many years of education? 
for that's that's not necessarily. That's, that's, cool. I mean, that's what it is, though. How many years of education? Well, it depends. So it's not just age. one polygenic score. You could have a polygenic score. But the for one that we've been mostly yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, the EAD. is yeah. all is mostly based on the educational thing. So years of, of, of education by uh, so, of, so overall. Or this, by, I mean, I feel like this isn't really important. This yeah, score, so right? So, what is the phenotype? Have gotten this far without discussing <laughs> so, but what is the outcome in yeah, the original two? I, mean, I know what it is. I'm just trying to throw. I, I want. So, I mean, I think. I think what's interesting, what turned out to be so interesting about this GWAS, is that the outcome is this, you know, extremely crude thing, which is how many years of schooling have you completed, and in fact, you know, that itself is imputed sometimes from studies which report, you know, the degree attained or, or whatever. And so, so there was, you know, these guys a lot of work to produce a quantitative phenotype that was harmonized across all these different studies. Um, and you know, initially, the reaction to education was, this is a bullshit thing to GWAS. There's no biology in this. Or it's too far from biology. But it turned out to be more molecularly tractable than anything that anybody had GWAS, except for you know, specific genetic products, so blood proteins, which are coded by genes, uh, and you know, anthropometric traits. Although at this point, you know, only height is outperforming Education in terms of variance. So, yeah, so, so even less than... not only is it molecularly tractable in that you can identify DNA differences between people that reliably correlate with differences in this fairly crude beam type, but that when you do the digging, as we did in the, the Psych Science paper, as, as other people are in the process of doing now, as Paige is going to show you in just a minute, the set of behavioral and environmental phenotypic links connecting the DNA with the education are face value. So these genetics are producing these individual differences via pathways, potentially mechanisms uh, that that are in accordance with theories we have uh, of, of how individual differences should affect differences in educational attainment. So we appear to have these, you know, genetics that are not only predictive but that are non-trivial with respect to uh, understanding uh, behavioral developmental mechanisms uh, that, that you know we might like to. Yeah, I, I wanted to just interject and just say that outcome is a perfect example of why of how simple is often the best way to go. Yeah, right. You you call it crude. I would say it's a perfectly beautiful measure. Right. The reason that I brought it up is that you know we often use the term education or performance. And, you know, for someone like David or me, and this is what Chandra was stuck on yesterday, listening to everybody talk, I mean, you know, whether you measure years of education or math, perform math test score performance or grades or graduating from college, which is not the same thing as years, that those are meaningfully different things. And what I would like to see overall as someone from the education field is someone who organized these studies around the outcomes and um, the actual outcomes because I think it would be incredibly insightful as an education researcher to understand how these things work for different aspects of, edu of what, how you're uh, conceptualizing education. And, but just a sec, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and if it is the case, if it is the case, that it all works very similarly, no matter how you measure that. That's also really important to know. And I, I mean, I just have to say, like, I, it is curious to me that we how how imprecise we have, how precise we have been about the genetic side and the intervention I side, and how incredibly <laughs> ambiguous uh, we've been about the education side. Of that. So. so I think that the interesting thing about uh, this score is that it predicts more variance in quantitative measure of academic achievement than actually years of education. So, so you know, although it's a very rough measure, it does predict a lot of variance in quantitative measures of academic achievement. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, among the things we, I think the question is, do you want to do the, the fine-grained phenotyping as part of your discovery operation or as part of your follow-up operation? Uh, and it turns out, I mean, Patrick, you're probably better to speak to this than me, but like, they did a power calculation, uh, and, and they could get more power by increasing sample size by an order of magnitude than they could by incre increasing the precision of phenotyping, which in your case, you were thinking about you know, cognitive performance, IQ scores instead of 
years of education, right? Oh, at least that was actually in the subject of well-being. But yeah, uh -huh. but, I mean, but it's just generally true. I mean, if you think that the, the, the crude measure is just, it's a noisy measure of something that's actually very fundamental, uh, then, then the noisy part's not going to be um, picked up, you know, it's not going to be correlated with any of the genes. Um, and so then as you increase sample size, you're just reducing that noise to a point that you have something that represents something really fundamental. And so when you take it into a different sample that has a precise measurement, you're going to do better in that sample than you did even in your discovery sample. Yeah, so but I think the question was, if I understand it correctly, is slightly different. So we don't have a polygenic score for uh, graduating from college. There's just a one polygenic score for years of education, and that itself is predictive of all of the things that we you mentioned. Have, yes. Yeah, they, they actually yeah. Yeah. There there is actually that, yeah. We also have a score for math ability, like two self-reported and highest math tests taken, and they're all really highly cor the, 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 okay. the, the correlation, the genetic correlation of the education <coughs> score and all of these other scores that I mentioned is, is not a whole lot less than the genetic correlation of um, education in one cohort and education in another cohort. Yeah, I actually wasn't saying that I I wanted to see the polygenetic thing done for different out for you know you want to see how it changes. I was just saying once you process. have it made and you were studying it, it's exactly why Paige got me involved in this thing because it was something you know looking at the way students move through math curricula in high school. She thought, well, this is a perfect example, and that's kind of what you know when we did the national. Mindset studies which have nothing to do with genetics. I mean, we conceptualize like this is the aspect of educational performance that we think this is going to matter for, and we think it'll be less important for this. Like, you know, we don't think it's going to be as important for content knowledge as measured by standardized achievement. We do think it's going to be important for your enrollment in um, higher level coursework. We do think it's important for GPA, and you know. We were right. Um, and, you know, funny. Um, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you, that that tells me, if I can say, you know, this works, you know, if I look at this in a study where I'm trying to understand grades versus a study where I'm trying to understand STEM majoring in college versus the thing, looking at the results and how they differ across those outcomes tells me something about education. Yeah. I ultimately don't really care. You know, I'm glad you all care about the genetics thing. I really am. But I'm just saying, as someone who really is interested in educational inequality and how the ed our educational system works, that's what's valuable to me. Yeah. Right. And you can only do that if you conceptualize, you know, as opposed to say, well, this just works no matter how you think about education. Yeah. Okay. So I. Paige, why don't you come up here? And okay, can, so, well, I want to thank you back for that. I mean, I, I just want to say one, I, I completely agree, and this is something that, you know, I've talked about in talks before, I've been dancing this talk, in which, um, you know, I have a, I don't have this slide here, but where, where the slide is cognitive and academic phenotypes are not interchangeable. Like, we cannot think of executive function and fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence and math, math achievement on a standardized test score and math course taking and graduating from high school and graduating from college and years of education and as, as um, replaceable phenotypes for which we're always going to see the same results. And I think this is, per in the twin context, this is particularly apparent when we look at, again, back to the, the role of C and the sense to which we see environmental family-based stratification um, to a different degree for different cognitive and academic phenotypes. At the same time, um, I think part of the reason that we get sloppy about our language is because, because the EA score is picking up um, on, on processes that are, are shining through a really heterogeneous group of people, right? So you have like adults in America who did 23andMe and like older British people and you're your G washing years of education in them. Like what's shining through in that is is a is a set of genetic signals that then when you port them into a lot of, and I agree, not redundant cognitive and academic phenotypes, you tend to tend to see similar patterns over and over again. So they predict grades and test scores and IQ scores and achieved education. Um, so I think 
back to your point about how um, genetics are a recurring influence, I think if we think of an educational process or an educational pipeline, there's something about the individual's embodied characteristics that they're carrying with them at like every step of that process. So, um, you know, Eric Turkheimer uses this example of genomes as this like thumb on the scale. It's like at every transition point, if you have this genome versus this genome, you're slightly more likely to go in this direction. So it's like this recurring effect that's happening at every transition point. I mean, there's also, right, inertia or path dependency. Yes. Or, right? Yeah. So I think so there's- life is a Matthew effect. Yeah. Yes. So that, I mean, I'm gonna come back to that point because I think that's where it's interesting to think about. Um, basically, I, as I'm reflecting on this, I basically want to take David's research program and Dan's research program and like do a mashup of them because I feel like I talk to you and you're like, these are the specific processes in the developmental life course that these genetics are associated with. And I talk to you and you're like, I want to push on whether or not people take algebra two in high school, and those intersect at certain points when the genetics influence or can be predictive of your likelihood of taking algebra two in high school. So that, that's sort of the intersection point. Um, so this is just re recapitulating what Dan just said. Um, whether you complete a college education, how far you go in school, your grades in school, um, your academic achievement test scores on standardized tests, all of those are correlated with your genetic makeup, and we're interested in the psychological and social processes that connect you to it's so crazy. Yeah. I, did you see that thing that, or didn't you see the thing? I saw it in. Is that me? Sorry. I saw it in. Uh, I want to say it was me the Washington Post, or maybe it was the Times. But it was. Um, it was an economist. So it's a working paper. You know, you know, publish the papers. Yeah. So just working papers. Um, so it's a working paper, and it was using polygenic risk score for educational attainment, and they were looking at well, the father's wealth, and then they also looked at this, something else. Yeah. Uh, right, and they found that um, not you know regardless of what quartile you were in for your father's so health, um, having a higher educational attainment polygenic risk score, you know there was like a dose response relationship yeah. between yeah. your polygenic risk score and your likelihood of graduating okay. college, but that the basically the <laughs> the kids with the worst polygenic risk score from in the wealthy families were more likely to graduate college than the kids with the best polygenic risk score in the port, like in the lowest, yeah. in the top quartile versus the lowest quartile. Yeah. I mean, so I, yes, it predicts. Yeah. But like, anyway, I just want to. Talk to you. I mean, this okay. is. I mean, this is why I have this other half of the slide here, which as soon as we, um, when you write things, you don't often get to pick your headlines. And sometimes they pick headlines that you hate. But this time, I really liked the headline that they picked for this thing that I wrote. Because I feel like as soon as we start talking about genotypes predicting um, every stage of a life course developmental pathway, it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that it is not the only thing that predicts every stage of a life course pathway. It predicts by a lot of other things we care about. And, and it can be, I mean, I think this is why I really like Dan's social mobility paper, is that like it can predict mobility from where your parents are, but you still have a floor of where your parents' socioeconomic status was and so yeah I mean I think I think that's a really important point but yeah I mean I, I'm agree I'm I'm yes I'm agree okay um, so because I uh, I've been at UT and I've talked to Rob for a long time um, I was really interested in looking at this in terms of the math curricular pipeline in high schools so Rob and Chandra have a paper in which they're looking at um, socioeconomic status differences between kids um, from wealthy families or college-educated families versus non-college-educated families in terms of what math classes do they begin taking when they begin high school, and then how does that initial tracking at the start of high school constrain their processes through high school math through the rest of high school, um, with a focus on the fact that you can't get into college unless you have, you have accrued a sufficient level of academic credentials. So you, um, it's, you cannot go to college in Texas, for instance, easily unless you've completed Algebra 2. Like it's, it's very, very difficult to matriculate to any university unless you've acquired that academic credential. So we can think of this as, you know, college admissions process 
like is a very explicit way of sorting people in which they're like, you have this academic credential and you don't, you get to go to this university and you don't. Your likelihood of getting to that point of having that academic credential is itself structured by where did you start in high school, right? You can't, you're very unlikely to get to Algebra 2 if you started in remedial math in the ninth grade. And so our idea was to essentially trace the education associated polygenic score through the math curricular pipeline in the same way that Robin Chandra had traced family advantage through the math curricular pipeline. How is it accruing at every time? How much can SES differentials at the end of high school be rooted in this kind of early selection process? Can we see the same thing for genetics? Um, and so this is just like my stylized figure for the importance of high school math. Like high school math predicts going to college, staying in college, um, obviously majoring in a STEM degree, um, earning more money late, later. You can fall down this whole black hole of economics papers on like whether math actually causally changes people's labor force outcomes. Um, and the answer seems to be mostly yes. So if you're looking at policy reforms, Texas has actually done this twice, where they made everyone take Algebra two in order to graduate from high school and then change their mind like 15 years later. Um, and North Carolina did a similar thing where it changed the way that kids were randomized and are selected into math in the ninth grade. And most of those have concluded that it's not just that smarter kids take more math, it's that taking more math in high school seems to be good for college going persistence, labor market participation, and earnings after that. So I, I think math is math in high school is a particularly interesting like crossroads or, or juncture to look at in terms of how people are navigating that transition from high school into college. <clears throat> so Paige, um, yeah. we woke to statistics with Jack McArdle in his first day of class. He would walk in and say, this is what I teach my children. And he would put one equation, it was math equals cash. <laughs> <laughs> that should be that on the next like, slide. That was like, I mean, yeah. Math equals cash. Yeah. yeah. So that, that could simplify your slide. But. OK, so this is um, ad health data. Um, with the EA3 score, with ad health removed from the discovery. Um, and what I have here is going from ninth, year one is ninth grade, so when kids are like 14, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, and then what they're doing after high school. And the color coding here is their education polygenic score. Okay, so we, we knew from Patrick's work that, I mean, by design, the educational team at Polygenic Score is correlated with people's ultimate education after high school. But um, what I find really interesting about this is that that genetic stratification is apparent early in this process, right? So in the ninth grade, we can already see that kids with higher Polygenic Scores are tracked into more advanced math classes. And then they're also more likely to, I'm using Dan's tracking persistence language here, persist in math, so they're much less likely to drop out of math in the upper level. Yeah. Oh, blue is higher and yellow is lower. I... And the thickness of the rivers is the number Oh, of yeah, yeah. So the thickness of the rivers is like I how... I about that. What? I did wonder why some were fat. Yeah, so, so, so the thickness of the rivers is how many people are in that math class at that year. So you can see that the modal track here is um, from algebra one to geometry, um, and then either to drop out of math or go on to algebra two. Um, how many of y'all took calculus in high school? Okay, so I think it's 8% of the ad health sample, this is all European ancestry kids, take calculus. And it's basically impossible to get to calculus unless you started in geometry, unless you were placed in the advanced math class in ninth grade. Like you can't get to that credential unless you were, it's very hard. if you were selected there. Um, there's, I think, like three people who could jump, jump the track. Um, this is in the 1990s when um, the average U.S. state, I think, required two or three years of math. And then there's been changes since then in terms of how many years of math states require in order to get out of high school. But that's a big part of why you see in year three and in particular in year four, kids are dropping dropping out of math, and they're selectively grads, what? Right? Like, but at, at health is just, well, mostly high school grads. So the, the graduation rate is very high, but these are all the kids who showed up at Wake 4, some of whom didn't graduate from high school. 
Yeah, but they were initially selected for that though, right? They were selected for being in secondary school in 94 or 5. At the beginning. So 7, grade grade seven to 12. 12. Right. So there's different amounts of selection, right. you know, depending on what year you were see, when you were enrolled in at health. Um, so these, these um, the people in, compared to the full sample or the full transcript sample of ad health, which includes um, non-European ancestry kids and kids without genetic data, the, the math curricular choices of these guys are upwardly selective. So like more people are taking calculus and persisting in math than, than the general sample. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have no understanding of the high school math education yeah. in the United States. So is calculus a more advanced than advanced math? Is this yeah. an order of progression? Yeah, so this thing? is the, the standard order in which... Um, sorry. This is the population path. Advanced yeah. math here is a, yeah. is, is a catch-all term that encompasses like taking AP statistics or um, discrete math or like, there are a bunch of other courses that some high schools offer okay. uh, that are generally taken in addition to calculus or in some cases an alternative to calculus, but which are not right, considered to be as advanced. But the, the rows are ordered in sequence from the least to so, so right. Ross can correct me because he did the transcript that. coding or helped with the transcript coding, but my understanding of it is part of it is about population norms, like what do people usually take in a sequence, and then the other is about prerequisites. Like, right. like in many places you cannot take calculus until you've had pre-calculus or you're not eligible to be in geometry until you've had algebra the 1. Se the sequence is ordered that way because of the studies of all the national databases, we just like this is the way that people progress through math. Yeah. So it's an empirical, empirical, it's not a value thing, it's an empirical, it's like, it typically calculus is the highest I point. See. There's some structural reasons why this is the empirical as well. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think it's also, there's cultural reasons people yeah. think calculus is prestigious. Okay. But you missed one <laughs> type of math. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but junior year, you were just, you were like, this, you're like, this is too hard, I want to take easy math. Yeah. 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 And so then people break down from yeah. I think it's a, just as a qualitative side note, as we, I was working on this paper, I also regularly have these coffee dates with students who are in my um, intro psych class, and the topic of one of the coffee dates amongst the undergraduates was what majors at UT will allow you to get a degree without taking calculus, and which majors will allow you to take calculus if they require it at ACC versus UT. And there, it was a whole conversation about choosing your college major around avoiding having to take calculus at the University of Texas. And I just thought it was amazing that like this dropout of I would rather take nothing than progress the calculus is something that that math avoidance like continues. Um, and it's exactly what y'all are trying to push on in terms of your willingness to engage in challenging courses. Um, so this is just um, other results that are probing that same pattern. Um, so the, the top graph here is um, starting with the mean college and score of everyone who's enrolled in any math class in the ninth grade, which is the vast majority of students. And then separate it out to the red line is the college and score of people who drop out of math in the 10th grade versus stay. And then red line is people who drop out of math in the 11th grade versus say. And basically the point here, um, and I think this is really directly relevant to your question, Rob, is that the, the, what we're seeing is that at every transition point, at every year they have to decide, am I going to take math again the next year? And at every year, this education attainment policy score is predicting the likelihood of persisting in that educational pipeline. Um, the other... Um, lower left graphed here is um, is to what extent that this persists um, net of family SES, but um, and this is a, a part that I find particularly interesting net of someone's grades. So what grade did they get in the math class? And what you see is that even when you're comparing people who have the same observed level of math achievement in the ninth grade, the people with the higher college score are more likely to persist in math the next year. So it's not operating entirely through the observed levels of achievement that are apparent to teachers and, and school administrators when they're just, when they're giving kids advice about what to do the next year. So it, so is one consequence of this the prediction that educational systems that have more junctures should magnify genetic associations because there are more ways for you to make 
choices. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. question. I mean, this is something we've talked about, like, comparing... Well, I'll tell you that about social inequality. Yeah. Like, so, so it, it, it operates the same way. Anytime you have a branch point, yeah. there's inequality is concentrated on that, and if you view the genetic thing as a form of inequality, that's it's, it's operating the exact same way. So. Yeah, so with an, how this would work, so we've talked about this in relation to school systems in which there's formal as opposed to informal tracking. So in Germany, if you are testing into gymnasium at age 10, but then you're on an academic track, versus in American high schools where we pretend there isn't tracking, but there is, does that, is that a reduced branch point? Like, if you get into an academic track school in a formal tracking school system, are you then carried through gymnasium, sort of like regardless of your genetic predisposition? Yeah, it's like once you get tenure, you separate. Yeah, like, is it like tenure? Or is it, you know, it's like we're, you are going to do this academically rigorous work because you are in the type of school in which everyone has to do this? Right, that's, that's what, like in Norway, is the same thing, they're vocational academic, and then within academic, there's either hard or theoretical math or applied math. There's no other choices, yeah. and you make it once. And yeah. then, so presumably there, there would be less recurrent genetic influence. Um, I was wondering if this put the Catholic school effect, you know, oh, the no, no What's choice. What's the Catholic school effect? The Catholic school, I mean, it's so much <laughs> arguable. It's not a Catholic school effect. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a famous, the first it's, famous school. It's somewhat right? arguable whether right? like, it's true right? or not, but like, the, um, it's that, you know, inequalities and in achievement and educational attainment are, are minimized in Catholic schools compared to public schools, but also compared to private, non-Catholic private schools. And the argument is that it's because of something called, like, the, well, there's many reasons, but the no, there's no choice. You, you have no choice. You are assigned, everybody takes the same class. You're all assigned in the same class, so it doesn't allow these things. And I'm wondering if that, if this would be the same if you just compare it to those kinds of schools. Yeah. You could do it at home. So I, I, I'm thinking about the three of thought that you, you were showing. If you, this, you have grades in ad health, right? Like, how does, how, how does the split, because you, you see it splitting like at the end of school and you just assume it's something happening, but I, I wonder if you also show it splitting by like grades within the class oh, and then where it goes from there. Yeah, so like amongst the people, how much is, I, I mean, so to reframe your question, what I think you're asking me is, amongst people who take calculus, they could have gotten a D and scraped by by the, the skin of their teeth versus excelled, and then you can split each yeah. node into yeah each, each node, node into like yeah. Great yeah. And see how it splits that way yeah I mean I, I actually think this is an interesting question yeah. about educational process independent of genotype that I think Rob might know the answer to, which is you see these um, is it better to be a struggling student in a more advanced math class or a star student in a less difficult math class? Yeah in terms of both human capital formation and also the pragmatics of getting into college and right. also like your identity and I, I, I know exactly if Jana was here what she would say to that. What would she it's say? Better be a struggling student. Student in a difficult I mean not a it's a partly it's a curve in a But so the, have you guys seen the quasi experimental work by Paul Hanselman and yes. Ed Domino <laughs> the, the Alp California did this and, and lots of schools in, 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 the, in the U.S. got pushed toward this algebra for all of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty ugly. I mean, it, it, well, one of the reasons well, why, yeah, like, one of the reasons how people have to retake it. Yeah, and, but it's also that the, one of the effects on the achievement score was the actual students who are the high achieving students. And so what happened? What there was, was a wrong? peer contagion that kind of brought them down a little bit. Not peer contagion. What was um, so the district, there's a district in which where y'all live, are pretty close to where y'all live, and they had it on, uh, every, every freshman has to show yeah. algebra. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. And it, you can it actually will. You can just bring up the overall yeah. achievement in that, and, and there's more findings than that. Yeah. That's what I'm going to focus on. And, and partly it's because the, the classes were so much more heterogeneous that you know, the students who are really going to excel in math didn't excel as much. As so, okay. So and then I, a lot of them failed. So I wanted to make two uh, meta points yeah. about this example just to abstract we'll out from, I mean, I, because of you, like, I'm now math curricular, I'm kind of obsessed with this topic. I find it really interesting. But abstracting out from that particular example, um, where I think 
the, the reason why I'm talking about this example is I think it gives um, us an example of how to how to connect a specific intervention with a specific set of genetics based on you've already done intervention work saying that part of part of why pushing on kids' mindsets might have a miracle happen is because they're more likely to challenge themselves to take harder math classes. And we're saying that we can predict statistically based on people's measured genotypes who's more likely to persist in math classes. And it seems like when we have like mechanisms from from our mediators from multiple approaches converging on the same process point, that's where I feel like there's there's real potential there. The other thing I want to just throw out there is I love Patrick's work. I think about this like, you know, Biobank is lovely because it has this nice policy reform. And then I think about how, again, Texas has had like, we're gonna make everyone take algebra two and then and then we're gonna make everyone not take algebra two. We've had two policy reforms in like opposite directions. And I would love to hear from people, like how many people would we need to genotype in Texas in order to like <laughs> do the UK Biobank version of this is a double policy reform in relation to people's policy Well, reform. Well, not only that, I mean, I just think Texas is a great example because we have the data archive. Yeah. So you, you, you can add data to it and you, it, it's, like, it's like Norway, you've got all the test scores and everything. But the... Um, uh, they also just induce a policy where in eighth grade, you get put into the one kind of track or another kind of track, oh, yeah. right? And, and, it's like a major. And, and middle school counselors decide, and wow. whether or not you're eligible for the top 10% rule at UT is determined apart by oh, that's whether you're or not. Yeah. So like, obviously there's gonna be huge inequalities in the informal ways in which counselors Recommend people, yeah. um, but then if, if you did a random sample of Texas kids and look at look, you know, you could you could do this kind of analysis, but then have this quasi experimental shock where all of a sudden there's this new way of tracking. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Regarding yeah. the sample size, if you want to do the, the regression discontinuity discontinuity design like they did, then you're you need a lot of data. But if so, private schools did they have to change their curriculum as well? I don't know. Because if they didn't, then you can do a different diff design mm -hmm. between public and private schools, and then if you use the whole sample, yeah. it's a lot easier to get that separate stuff going. I mean, you yeah. just do that to a the, the private schools have to fix it on curriculum. Say again? But the school has to do that to itself, it's self selecting to the private school. Yeah, no, definitely. But yeah. if, you have just, if you have parallel trends before, then you can make a case that. Uh, it's well identified. Yeah. They can they can choose to private schools precisely because they want to take that you know better math <coughs> because of policy change, right? That would like oh. assumption. And that's so differential yeah. in yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, exactly. Yeah. Patrick, I feel like you have a yeah. Well I mean I just well, I, I mean, it, it depends on how so so you need a certain sample size to depending on your design, right? So that's really important. For the specific question, you probably need something like four times as large to get a G bike. I, I mean, it depends on how big the interaction you think is. Like, I think that if the interaction is um, smaller than maybe like one half the direct effect, then, then maybe it's, well, I, you know, it depends on how big the effect you want to see. But, but four times as large as well. We've like, got a power calculator right here. I was going to say, I'm going to put something on by two. It's, <laughs> it's, four times, right? it's the same size as the main effect, it's four times the size. Right, and so, um, you know. So if you have a really well-powered design, then uh, you can get a much smaller sample size, but you need something that's much larger if you want to see the much larger than the direct effect. Has the see. main effect been tested in Texas? <coughs> um, the main effect of? Of the policy. Oh, I, no, I actually don't know. So there is like, I, Rob and David probably know more, but yeah. you can get the TEA data all in one place. There's like a data security yeah. room somewhere on campus. I've worked with, yeah. Um, I've, Jeff Denning was the one who actually worked it. But yeah, you can get you can get the data on sex students. It's pretty comprehensive. Yeah, interesting. So just to set up, we're, we're I guess to, to finish the first half of this presentation and segue into the second half, which is, you know, why should you interventionists genotype your participants, which Pietro is going to explain to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I, I want to essentially make the case for why we want you to genotype your participants, um, which, is, which is that, you know, you can help us understand something that we think is important. And, and, and so this, this, this diagram was, was up there uh, yesterday, <laughs> right, in which, you know, you have 
some exposure of interest. There are mediators of the effect of that exposure on some outcome, and you'd, you'd like to understand these mediators. You know, here we've got genetics as the exposure of interest. Education is the outcome. There literally is no direct path. Right? There is no direct path from DNA to educational attainment. It's all mediated by lots of stuff. Right? So, so there are many, many of these things. We would like to understand what these things are. We think we can do observational correlational research to help inform uh, ideas about what some of these things are, which uh, we then might uh, want to intervene on. But what Paige has suggested uh, is that uh, we, we may, in fact, be able to use interventions directly in this process to help discover what these mediators are. So uh, you can uh, perturb one of these mediators with an intervention and then ask if that modifies the genotype-phenotype relationship. Um, and, and so the idea is that you can, you can figure out what the mechanisms are uh, connecting genes with education um, by manipulating hypothesized mechanisms, which is something that you're in a position to do as interventionists. Um, and then with that, we'll get to Pietro. All right. So then the other side of the coin would be why, what do you gain? What do, I like to call them randomistas, non, randomistas. not interventionists. <laughs> but what do randomistas gain from uh, uh, getting genotype? And so, so what, one way is to think about the graph that was there yesterday, right? So this type of graph, when we say, usually people are interested in the treatment effect on the uh, on the proximal outcome or on the final outcome, so educational attainment, for instance. And it could be that uh, genes can be helpful to, like, just as a control variable, that could be helpful to identify the treatment effect. Why? Because they, uh, they reduce noise, they control for a whole bunch of things that are different across people, they shrink the standard errors. So, like, just having the, um, the genes as, your, as controls can help you and... Somewhere we have a graph where, where we show, like, depending on how much the intervention costs and compare it to how much it costs to genotype people, it could, there's a tipping point basically where it's cheaper to genotype people and have fewer children intervene on rather than, uh, than the other way around. Can I make a, David Cesarini always brings up this point. When you're doing these interventions, you usually have a pretreatment measure of the outcome. And so it's, it's not... It's not quite enough to just look at the heritability. You want to look at what, like, the excess heritability, or like, you know, the, the, the incremental <laughs> explanatory power beyond um, pre-treatment outcomes, are, which is it's a bit tricky. So, let me hold the thought for a second. But uh, so that's one thing that could be useful. The other thing is that just uh, do a G by intervention. So you can do uh, to test heterogeneity of treatment effects, which is what Patrick and other people have talked about yesterday. I'm not going to go too much in detail there. Uh, and so, like, just simply say, we know that the intervention doesn't work the same for everyone. We know that everyone uh, can be genotyped and can be mapped in the same way across this 2 million uh, uh, SNPs uh, dimension. And, you know, we can use that information to understand heterogeneity of responses to the same type of treatment. That could be very useful. That could be very interesting, both to understand like how many, what is the variance of people who benefit from the treatment and those who don't. That could just be an interesting uh, information. And as well, maybe predictive power afterwards. Can we, we go back to, uh, to do a concrete example? If you go back to Paige's slides. Uh, uh, Paige's slides there. are going to be hard. Sorry. But so, so imagine, right, that the E is uh, taking algebra 2 in your junior year of high school. Uh, the treatment is a policy which forces you to take algebra 2 uh, in high school. Um, and then we have education genetics and, and the, the pH, the phenotype there is educational. Uh, for sure. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a college entry. Right. So um, this simple model of effective heterogeneity, so treatment by prior polygenic score. Um, and if, say, our outcome is getting to calculus senior year. Mm -hmm. um, the, the E. There, right? The phenotype. Oh. So, uh, the, phenotype, the final outcome is calculus. Let's pretend. Okay. Yeah. Or yeah. I mean, it could be majoring in STEM, whatever. Um, only some people are going to be ever, based on the ninth grade math class, even when properly motivated, only some people will ever get calculus because they have to have been in the ninth grade math class that, like, in this case, like geometry or something. Um, or let's, let's say you do the intervention sophomore year where it's like you've got to be in a certain class by sophomore year or else it's very unlikely. Um, 
the, then, then your, your polygenic score would be positively correlated with treatment effect because you, whatever, whatever polygenic score thing from the past caused you to sort into a certain math class level. But among people within a given math class, it might be the people with relatively lower polygenic score who counterfactually wouldn't have stayed on the, on the track. So, um, it, so it feels like um, there. I'm just raising, raising the point that there there could be um, misleading moderation results mm -hmm. if you don't know the social structure that people have already opted into uh, pre random assignment. So okay, does that make sense? So, so, it, so go ahead. Uh, so the way I would think about that is that. Genes can help you in two ways. They can help you to understand selection, and they can help you understand what is, given the selection, what is the uh, heterogeneity of treatment effect. So what you're saying, I think, is that genes select you into the type of environment where treatment is going to be administered, and you have to take that into account. But you can take that into account by other work, looking at other work, like the ones that have been shown before, that makes you, gives you a better understanding of how the, the polygenic score kind of uh, puts the thumb on the scale on who gets to that specific setting and then try to controlling controlling for that you can still have above and beyond that selection effect the fact that the treatment itself might have might be more or less effective for people who are genetically predisposed to you know have calculus intake or I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of making trying to make a simpler point that like unconditionally yeah. Treatment effect work might work larger for getting calculus for higher polygenic score people, but conditional on your math class, it might be negative. So, can I clarify here? I think um, so. To use this as an example, forty percent of all uh, people in the U.S. today, kids, high school kids, don't take a math class in the senior year. So, I think what David's saying, rather than calculus, is given where kids enter in ninth grade, do they uh, fulfill their full potential to get as far as possible in math, because math has these wonderful effects throughout the life course. But uh, the question then becomes something Heckman's written about a lot, and I'm uh, trying to resolve with the FADOT stuff, is essentially what the treatment can do is set kids on different trajectories, right? And so, it, David, I think what you're getting at is, does the intervention make it so that they go as far as possible, which then would set them on a, a in theory, a trajectory that leads to higher earnings throughout the life course and so on, which we observe. Yeah. And the um, genetic uh, markers would be something we know are prior to everything else. And it's been very difficult for people to resolve how people get onto these trajectories. Is it is there a cause or is it something unobserved? So, so I want to make a kind of yeah, just to make a more general thing. To make, it's helpful to think about this math example. But going back, I think you're totally right. And going back to polygenic scores are variables, which means it's the polygenic score and then everything that carries with it if you're including it as a moderator. And what you're suggesting is that. Some of the correlates of the polygenic score in terms of your current opportunity structure yeah. might moderate the treatment effect differently than the embodied characteristics of intelligence or conscientiousness or whatever that are also carried by the polygenic score. And so to the extent that you have a model in which you just have G by I, if G is creating environments that make the intervention more useful, but embodied characteristics that make the intervention less necessary, that's going to pull the interaction effect in two different directions. Is that what you're... Or it could accelerate the, the effect yeah, of the intervention both, for right? people who... Yeah, I, I guess what I'm making the argument for, or what, what, what seems obvious <coughs> now in the math example, given that you have positive or negative moderation, whether it's conditional on your part of math class or not, hypothetically, is a need to have the G and the E and the spin opportunity structure. Yeah. That like like you you have to condition on that because you have to know where people's where where people have already yeah. sorted. And and just controlling for, for the polygenic score wouldn't wouldn't have given us uh, in this hypothetical yeah. world the right uh, I also think that it complicates I mean even if it wasn't working in, in the opposite directions, right? Like so let's say you let's say they both work positively and then you just do this un you know the simple G by I interaction effect. Right? The interpretation of that is either these kids have 
personality or intellectual characteristics that, that make them profit more from this policy, or these kids carry with them an opportunity structure that yeah. makes profiting from this this intervention at all possible. And those are I, those are different theoretical policy conclusions. Well. Yeah. I think that's a really yeah. interesting. I totally agree, and in some sense, I think that's going from what we have here, point two to point three. So the idea is that, like, point two is simply saying, I have a new tool that is like this new variable. I know it's predetermined, and I know I can use it the way I've used a whole bunch of other variables. Only that it gives me a little bit more of insight because the work that Dan and Paige and everyone else has done tells me a lot more about this specific variable. And I can use it to like understand what was going on afterward in, in other setting. The third point is to go exactly where you're saying and say, okay, now I have this coefficient. I see that there is a positive interaction between the polygenic score and the treatment effect. Now, what does that actually mean? And in order to answer that question, we need a lot more complicated model. Like this could be even maybe too much of a simple model. Uh, it could be something more even complicated to, to actually unpack what that heterogeneity in the treatment effect really means. But it does help to have both an intervention and a nice randomized intervention that we know, that have good causal properties, statistically speaking, and have the genotypes that also have interesting causal or you know, predetermined properties in, uh, uh, in here. Because we can exclude a whole bunch of paths because of the way things have been administered, basically. This really underscores the value of having non-white samples of genes also because yeah. the environment and discrimination are such an important latent context yeah. of all that you're talking about. And without a good measure of the genes that are uniform measure across racial groups, you really see the, the uh, liability here. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, Patrick is still in that question as we speak. Well, I, I think we'll talk about this in, in, when we get to the limitations. I think I think that's. <coughs> yeah, maybe we have different opinions about how tractable that, that problem is. I'd, I'd be curious to, to hear thoughts. So another thing that is just like uh, cheaper ways of convincing it on the mist us that we need. Uh, no. No, no. Go back. You missed one. I missed one. Yeah, this one. This it is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, randomness that's why it's interesting to have genes. So the first thing is that this seems to be like a new shiny tool that funders could be interested in. So if you do put this in, like it is, it's not going to hurt probably. Gene curious Because we're gene curious randomness. <laughs> uh, it's good for science in the sense that uh, if you do collect this type of information, it can be it, it can be very helpful to like for other people that get access to the data then to like understand new opportunities of research uh, mechanisms of uh, like whatever is going on. So even if you don't necessarily use it right away in the first paper, it's something that can be, uh, can be useful for afterwards. And uh, one other thing that it's kind of a selling point and it's going back to what uh, Pat mentioned before is that I think it could be useful also for the intervention itself. So a nice thing of the, of the genetics is that it doesn't change. So regardless of when you collect it, it gives you information about pre-treatment variables that maybe you didn't collect or you couldn't collect. Maybe it's impossible to phenotype those things in the pre-treatment or maybe you just didn't have enough money so you couldn't uh, phenotype it. And the nice thing is that you ask, you just have to ask for one thing. So you have to ask for people to spit in a, in a tube and you get a ton of possible polygenic scores out of it. So in some sense, if someone tells you, you only have two minutes in the, in the pre-treatment questionnaire, what do you want to do? What question do you want to ask? You might just want to ask, can you spit in this tube? And then, and that's it. <coughs> so so an example from yesterday, I was just thinking about, with, with respect to uh, Brian's intervention, right? Where, where or the Chris. work you guys do, sorry, Chris, um, where, where you're manipulating uh, children's ideas about uh, food to try and change their, their eating behavior in school lunch, you might be concerned with various aspects of their physiology and metabolism uh, that are expensive to measure, particularly in the context of a preliminary trial, uh, but that likely have some influence on their eating behavior uh, and therefore perhaps the degree of their response to your intervention. With DNA, you could quantify you know, small amounts of, of variance, but you, you, mean, you could still put your hands around 
uh, genetic predisposition to obesity, um, and, and you know, potentially other aspects of, of metabolism. Uh, and you know maybe even food prep, but yeah. know, nutrition. Possibly, is yeah. So the thing is that it's not going to be. I think one reason I wanted him to present because I was like, this is one where you could get DNA relevant to eating yeah. and relative to reward sensitivity at risk taking, which is one of the mechanisms we are talking about risk taking. <laughs> so Patrick and I and a whole bunch of other people are actually just did a GWAS on risk taking. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You know, so the idea is that basically it's not better than the phenotype. Right? So the polygenic score is not as predictive as, as the phenotype itself most of the time. But it is predetermined. It's not influenced by whatever happened from conception all the way to the treatment. And it, it, it has this like multi-tool uh, feature that could be, could be potentially used. So I have a question, maybe very basic, but it, this goes to Rob's point about differentiating educational outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. where, where what we're often interested in is like progress through your academic track making it Next course, but that's different from years of education, different from test scores, and so on. And then one answer has been, well, they're all positively correlated. But uh, it, it, I guess what, what I'm wondering is, would it be possible to get the non-shared variance in the G1 for a certain thing and then test that as a potential moderator? Right? So so because presumably they're correlated in part because genes that help you stand up straight and have your eyes work and things like that are all correlated with doing well in school. And that's, that has nothing to do necessarily with. Yeah. So this is, I mean, I shouldn't just speak for Elliot, but I mean, part of part of genomic sense, which is this um, method for analyzing or co-analyzing summary statistics for multiple GWASs over correlated traits. One potential application of that is to try to pull out genetics of correlated traits, right? So something that we've been working on is education is associated genetically correlated with IQ. But then there's genetic variance in education that's independent of IQ. We can call that like non-cognitive in the like original sense of it's not cognitive ability, it's something else. Could you use that as a tool to sort of break EA into um, is it do people select into higher math classes because they are um, genetically predisposed to have better fluid intelligence, or because they're genetically predisposed to be curious, motivated, and like our problems, right? Like those are different embodied characteristic pathways and so something. So I do well, think like they have parents who push them in. Yes. Yeah, I mean I think for EA genetics that's like particularly like to what extent is all of the positive score predicting going to a higher math class due to the fact that that positive score is tapping parental genetics that are correlated with parental knowledge and expertise. Right, so disentangling these kind of like social genetic effects from like direct <coughs> genetic effects, I think is. But anyways, to, to get at your question, I do think people are moving towards thinking about two box statistics in a more multivariate way. Like how can we leverage them to for more uniqueness versus overlap? But that's and all of these post. All of these uh, innovations that have been done after the genotype has been collected can still be used retrospectively in some sense. So that's kind of the, I think we called it the time machine mm -hmm. the idea. Like the nice thing about this is that if you have that, you can always go back and kind of use these tools on that specific thing. So even if you forgot to ask a question that turns out to be important, you have a poor man's proxy of that, uh, of that question. So. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to come up with it's yes. like a bad band name, like coming up with some combination of Geno Curious, Randomises, and the Time Machine. Sounds like a Doctor Who episode. So, um, so uh, I yeah, just want to we're, we're, yeah, exactly. So there's one question that we wanted to kind of pose. So, so these two slides are basically since we said that we wanted to write grants, I think these are like potential bullet points in grants that uh, that Geno Curious Randomistas write. Uh, one question that it's kind of up for grabs and that then uh, threw in the, in the pit uh, yesterday and we would like to say it again. Uh, should we or can we use genes to select who gets treatment? Can we use genes to target treatment? And the idea, so there's a lot of caveats and it's, uh, it's dangerous to do that not only because uh, it has to be explained very, very well because people are going to be extremely distasteful of this. But also because like, technically it's unclear whether genetic prediction is going to be more accurate than other stuff. And so it, it could just be potentially harmful to say 
I select, I, uh, I target treatments to specific genotypes because we don't have yet a good uh, predictive power of this. So maybe we shouldn't do it even just because we don't, we're not there yet. However, it could be that, um, and sorry, and at the same time, so the phenotype when available is probably more accurate for the targeting uh, of, the inter of the intervention. So that clearly seems to be a dominant strategy. Uh, one thing that uh, was brought up is that it could be that if people know that the phenotype is going to be used for the intervention targeting or for the policy, then people can try to change the phenotype. So think about SAT scores. Everyone knows that SAT scores are important to go to college. So if you really want to go to college, you keep on taking the SAT until you have a score that is good enough. So phenotypes can be changed and can be gained. You can game the system if you know that the policy or the treatment is based on the phenotype. You cannot do that with the genotype. So in some sense, like it's not distortive. Uh, no behavior can be distortive of the, of the genotype. So that could be one of the reasons potentially to, to do this. Uh, another, another thing is that maybe uh, sometimes the phenotype is not available or uh, it's just a lot harder to measure, a lot more costly to measure than having the, uh, the genotype. So, but we don't really know. Yeah, and I think, I think that the bullet that's not on the slide you know, that relates to this question of, of potentially using genetics to investigate effects of discrimination is that, that we don't have comparable genetic prediction that can be applied across people of different ancestries. Um, and so were we to try and use DNA to pick who we treat, we would be able to do that with, with you know, whatever precision we have in people who are of generally European descent and, and not of other people. Uh, and, and so that's kind of a non-starter. Uh, and, and I think whether we think this will ultimately ever be possible does in some sense need to depend on whether we think we'll ever have uh, a genetic measurement that we can apply and interpret uniformly across populations of different ancestry. And I, I guess I'm leaning no on that, but, but you know, I, I'm curious to hear other thoughts. So I'm going to propose that we discuss that while we take a coffee break, and then we can maybe switch to our next group.